Levin. Mark Levin, America's Paul Revere. Call him now at 877-381-3811. I believe Obama will get his vote out of Congress. Thanks to the Republicans, I believe he will get his vote out of Congress. They never stand up to this guy. It's an amazing thing to me. I wanted to bring my buddy Andy McCarthy on because there is no better expert on these sorts of matters than than Andy. And uh, Andy McCarthy, how are you, my friend? I'm doing great, Mark. Congratulations on uh, well, on the Liberty Amendment. It's a, oh, thank it's you. Tremendous. And thank you, thank you for your great review. I really appreciate that too. I, I liked uh, reading the book even more than writing the review, so it was just terrific. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I want you to listen to McCain on Fox News. What's the show called? I don't remember. Fox News, Fox and Friends, Fox News uh, this morning. Uh, Brian Kilmeade, good guy, and McCain's response. I'd like you to respond to this, Andy McCarthy. Cut 13, go. I know you met with General Idris, who is a defector from the Syrian army, who's come out. Some say that he does have tie to Muslim extremists. I don't know. Well, listen to this video, Senator McCain, of a uh, Syrian, uh, it looks like a, a, a fighter a fighter jet being shot out of the sky. Listen to what said they say afterwards. Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! I, I have a problem uh, helping those people out if they're screaming that? that after a hit. Do you have a, do you have would you have a problem with American and Christian saying thank God thank God that's what it, that's what they're saying come on uh, of course they are Muslims but they are moderates and I guarantee you that they are moderates I know them and I've been with them for someone to say Allah Akbar is about as offensive yeah. as someone saying thank God. You know, uh, Andy McCarthy, is this man as ignorant as he appears to be? I think so. Uh, you know, and the, the, shortly stated, I think so. I mean, anyone who could, with a straight face or as straight a face as, as McCain gets, um, could make a statement like that after the 20 years of, of history that we have, and in light of the uh, scholarship that you can actually uh, master in about five minutes on the on the internet about what the background of uh, of the phrase Allahu Akbar means. I mean, it's just, uh, it's it's mind-boggling, and the only thing I can say is somebody who's, who strongly argued against American military intervention in Syria is that I think McCain may have done more for the cause of non-intervention today with that idiotic remark than anything that we could have come up with in the non-interventionist camp. Well, before I... Uh... I have you, and if you don't mind, I would like you to explain what does this mean? What's the history behind this? I got an email from our mutual friend, dear friend, Deborah Burlingame. Yes. And she responded to McCain. She said, Alhu Akbar is the very last human sound on the cockpit voice recorder of United Flight 93 as it screamed into the ground at 580 miles per hour. Yes, our Deborah. leadership has lost its mind. That's what she said. Yeah, and she's exactly right about that. It's the last sound that the uh, uh, that those who were uh, mass murdered by uh, the jihad mass murderer uh, Nidal Hassan heard uh, when he was uh, when he murdered 13 of them and and wounded uh, a couple of dozen others. Um, you know, so is it like uh, Christians in America saying "Thank God"? Is that what uh, it is? Yeah, yeah, right. Sure. Th- thank God. You know. Um, first of all, it doesn't mean thank God at all. I mean, even even literally, McCain is completely mo- wrong. It means God is greater. It's often been translated as God is greatest. That's actually um, not completely accurate. It, it, it's a comparative, literally, in Islam, and there's a reason for that. Um, this is a philosophy, and we're talking in particular about Islamic supremacists, who see themselves at war with everybody who doesn't see the world as they do. And they believe they'll win because their God is greater than everybody else's God. That's the, that's the genesis of the expression. It literally means God is greater. And as is the case with, uh, with almost everything um, that, that comes out of Islamic heritage, this traces back to Muhammad. Uh, it, it has been used, the phrase has been used as a war cry because Mohammed used it as a war cry when he attacked the Jews of Kaibar in uh, the the early phrase of Islamic history, and that's not me making it up. That's that's right out of Islamic scripture. 
And, uh, hmm. and so um, McCain says this. He's not challenged. And uh, wh- why is he the voice in the face of every military action or, or contemplated action in this country? Where, where the, what the hell is that? I think people are paralyzed uh, over his uh, heroism, and you know, they, I think they unfortunately conflate and confuse uh, his heroism during the Vietnam War with uh, you know military strategic brilliance on his part, which I don't think he's ever been. Uh, certainly, uh, <laughs> I don't think uh, you know those who were uh, who were educated with him and um, and who've been around him would would accuse him of that. But uh, the, the Republicans have fallen lockstep behind him and. You know he's been all over the place, Mark. He, uh, you know, back in uh, with respect to Libya, you know, one minute he was uh, in Gaddafi's tent toasting the great relationship between the United States and Gaddafi's regime, which he argued in favor of us uh, supporting. The next minute, uh, you know, he's saying that uh, Gaddafi's got to go and he wants to have an undeclared war against him, which, uh, you know, he helped to uh, to convince Obama to launch uh, in Egypt. He said that the Muslim Brotherhood needed to be kept out of any government because they support Sharia, uh, which he said was undemocratic, particularly with respect to, to women. Then when the Muslim Brotherhood was installed, he decided they weren't so bad after all and that these were guys we could play ball with, and that Sharia isn't so bad, uh, it turns out, either. Uh, and now, you know, he's, he's no matter how wrong he is, uh, the Republicans seem to line up right behind him, and it's uh, it's maddening and it's baffling. And I don't think things are going to get better for them until they stop doing it. What do you make of John Boehner coming right out of the White House? He seems to be thrilled that Obama summoned him there and that they had a conversation, and he and he uh, deigned to uh, uh, ask him uh, if for his support. Well, I think that Boehner, Mark, ha- has pretty reliably fallen behind. McCain, uh, with respect to virtually everything um, that comes up in the area of, uh, of national security and foreign policy, particularly with respect uh, to radical Islam. You'll recall, uh, I guess it was a, a, a couple of years ago now, that uh, you know Michelle Bachman and Louis Gohmert and a couple of our other great conservatives uh, in, in the House raised some questions about people with Muslim Brotherhood ties um, who had infiltrated our government were working in uh, high positions. And after McCain came down and, and gave a speech on the floor of the Senate, which castigated Michelle Bachman and the others for raising these concerns, uh, Boehner was right there behind him, echoing the same things that McCain had said. And Boehner, I feel, did as much as possible to... Um to harm Michelle Bachman's uh, re-election chances, don't you? I certainly don't think, uh, you know, to the extent he was in a position to help, I don't think he lifted a finger. And I think to the extent that there was ambiguity about whether she'd be able to continue on on the Intelligence Committee and, and the like, that, that certainly was damaging to her. Ha- uh, happily, she uh, she pulled it out, but it was, a much, it was a lot harder race, I think, than it needed to be. What is the foreign policy under this administration? Do you know? I think to the extent... The limited extent that you could uh, could see a, a coherent foreign policy at all, um, there are, the people in the administration think that the Islamic supremacists, the Muslim Brotherhood being the uh, the front of that parade, are a fact of life in the Middle East and have to be treated as if they were a stabilizing influence in the hope that they'll become a stabilizing influence. So uh, the o- Obama administration becomes the uh, the the next in a long line of, uh, of governments that have made the, the tragic calculation that the Muslim Brotherhood and the Islamic radicals uh, are people that you can, uh, you know, tame, negotiate with, and, uh, and, and basically try to control. Uh, and, you know, I think he's been bitten by that, uh, just like pretty much every regime that's tried it has been bitten by it. And yet Benghazi, you would think, would teach him otherwise. Well, I mean, the you know, the I, attack, I, the 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 Islamo Nazi attack on the four uh, on that the consulate and the murder of four American citizens, including the ambassador, you would think that would uh, teach a president something. Yeah, well, you would hope it would, but I I think that they're so dug into this position. Remember, Mark, uh, you know, I think it was within the first day of his presidency that uh, that 
Obama began uh, embracing Islamists. Uh, you know, and it was the uh, the first trip that he decided to make uh, overseas was to Turkey. He made the big speech in 2009 uh, in Egypt that the Muslim Brotherhood was invited to. Um, he's very, very dug into this policy, and he has never seemed to me during during his presidency or anything I know about him before that uh, to be somebody who is capable of saying I was wrong uh, once he's dug in. You know what amazes me is we step back and look at this. Let's just pull back a little bit. This guy's IRS was targeting conservatives, Tea Party groups, uh, pro-Israel groups, evangelical groups. Um, you look at that. You also look at uh, this Benghazi situation. We still know what he was doing for nine hours or so, eight and a half, nine hours. Um, I theorize he went to sleep uh, after the attack on Benghazi. I mean, uh, he he thumbs his nose at Congress and the Constitution. We've talked about it. I've written about it. Others have as well. Um, you know, he defies court orders as he did in the BP case, as he did in the Obamacare case in Florida, violates the appointments clause with his appointments to the National Labor Relations Board, among other places, rewrites statutes like Obamacare and workfare out of welfare. And so, and the Republicans, right, yeah, okay, we, we have to trust what the president says, you know, he means, well, what is going on? We have no effective opposition, at least at the... Uh... Republican establishment level uh, against this president, and I think he took the measure of them in the early months of his presidency. Uh, he he got the green light in terms of what he thought he'd be able to get away with, and his basic approach to the presidency has been, um, I'm going to use the awesome powers that are available to me. I'm not saying authorization now. I'm saying power, the raw power that he has, and I dare you to stop me. And of course, the framers did give Congress a lot of means to stop a president uh, who is excessive and abusive. But th- those powers, those means of, of reining in such a president don't mean anything if you don't make use of them. And, and these guys have decided, for whatever reason, uh, that they are not going to stop this president. And here we are, Andy McCarthy, really uh the nation uh, involved, really not the nation, but the nation witnessing the spectacle over Syria, when in about three and a half weeks they start to implement Obamacare, which is going to have a permanent effect on this. As I'm sitting there thinking, you know, at six months from now, nobody's going to be talking about this. Nobody. Meanwhile, Obamacare will be rolling along. Isn't that interesting? Right, and, and they have basically signaled that they won't support the move to defund it, which is, which is astounding to me. You know, I know the, the smart position is supposed to be that, uh, you know, Obamacare is going to collapse of its own weight and we don't need to do anything. There's better ways to oppose it. Obama has already taken the position himself that parts of Obamacare can be defunded because he's doing that unilaterally. Uh, so the parts that he's not ready to implement or thinks that it won't be politically expedient to implement he himself has already made the decision not to put into effect. Now, the Republicans, as I understand it, in the defunding movement, they're not saying um, let's repeal Obamacare by defunding it. They're basically saying we, our Congress, we're the ones who appropriate the money. We decide what gets funded and what doesn't get funded. That's the, that's the constitutional system. Uh, and if the president is taking the position that, you know, unilaterally, that parts of it can't go into effect, it should be for Congress to make the decision that if the law, which we were told had to be comprehensive, is not ready to go into effect comprehensively, then none of it should go into effect. And mm-hmm. that's certainly a position that makes sense and one that Congress is entitled to stake out. Yeah, well, they're, they're just too scared. They're scared. They're, they're commentators on TV, Rove among them. They're scared. What will the president do? What will the pre- Hey, let's try it. Let's try it once. Let's see what happens just once when we do this. Andy McCarthy, God bless you, my friend, and uh, thank God for you, may I say. Thanks, Mark.